This episode of Author Stories is brought to you by the Writing Mastery Academy. Founded by Jessica Brody, author of the best-selling plotting guide, Save the Cat Writes a Novel. The Writing Mastery Academy features online, on-demand writing courses, including the official Save the Cat Writes a Novel companion course. Novel fast drafting, crafting dynamic characters, and productivity hacks for writers to name just a few, plus monthly live webinars on various writing topics. Go to jessicabrody.com slash hank to learn more and get your first month of unlimited access to all the content for just $6. That's right, just $6. jessicabrody.com slash hank. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Flynn Berry back on the show with me to talk about her brand new book, Northern Spy. This is a book that must be on your uh, your spring reading list, uh, to be sure. If you love thrillers and and exciting stories the way I do, this is this is a must have. Uh, Flynn was on the show a couple of years ago talking about her current book at the time, A Double Life. A lot has happened in the world since then, and uh, super excited to catch up with Flynn today. Welcome back to the show, Flynn. Thank you so much for having me back. I am super excited. Uh, so, Flynn. Uh, What's what's been going on between, uh, you know, when we talked last time, a, a double life was just coming out. Um, it went on to find just a massive audience. People love that book. Um, that was your sophomore effort, if I remember right. Um, how did that go? And, and what's life been like since? So it seems like you know, a decade ago. Uh, <laughs> I when we had our interview last, I was. Um, about to have my son I was pregnant at the time and I was working on Northern Spy then I was I was in the the sort of first draft stages and so since then um, I've had two boys and they're now two and a half and six months old or seven months old and I worked on Northern Spy pretty much uh, the whole time since we last spoke and finished up the the page proofs uh, last September and now it's coming out so that's it's been a, a busy few years heck yeah it has uh to to be able to put a book out like Northern Spy while having two little bitty ones uh that that, that is an amazing accomplishment can I just say I mean it's just it's just sheer chaos really most days it just feels like <laughs> complete chaos um, I think I think what I had to do with writing is I had to pretend that sleep deprivation would increase my creativity and it would make me a better writer uh, because otherwise I would have just lost my mind. So, so my strategy was just to tell myself that even if my mind feels really scattered or I don't feel like I can like hold a thought in my head that somehow the, the work would get done. And I do think that there's some strange thing about waking up in the middle of the night with a baby that feels almost dangerous like it felt sort of similar to the atmosphere that I was trying to create in the book so it in a, in a way I do think it helped my writing you know I was going to ask you that that um you know some people swear by um the the fact that that a little chaos is necessary to truly be creative do, do you buy into that or I, I mean the the life that you've been living for the last few years uh, you you may not um, know what it, what it's like on the other side of that, but d- do you feel like that if everything was just calm and you had all of the time to yourself in the world that you could possibly want, could could you be as creative as you have been? I don't know. I mean, I think at this stage in my life, I have now two tiny boys, and I think I do have a pretty big longing for you know 
going to a library and sitting down at a library carol and just reading and writing for eight hours at a time, which is so not my normal day-to-day life. But then one of my favorite writers is Maggie O'Farrell, who wrote Hamnet and quite a few other books. And she said that having children has been a really good editor for her because she can only sort of give time to the best ideas that you know like having children put such a pressure on her time that she can't sort of go off on certain tangents that maybe she would have before and that her books are kind of sharper or stronger because of that and I, I do think that's the case maybe that having kids means you can't you can't just be locked up in your own mind and that that has to be useful for a writer like a lot of my favorite writers have pretty intense day jobs or um, life experience and I think that does have to inform your work. Yeah. Are are there things that you do to protect your writing time? Uh, or are, are you just writing kind of in snatches between, uh, you know, other life chaos? Mm. So with Northern Spy, I was writing it often in my older son's nap times. Uh, he would fall asleep on my lap and I would sit at my desk and work with him sleeping against me which was really lovely actually it just felt really sort of like special and tender um and it's also it's kind of nice in a way because with writing it's infinite like you you can never feel like you're done for the day like nobody's gonna call you up and say you know like good job today you can you can clock off and go have a beer or something (laughs) and so in a way having kids is nice because if you know you only have you know two hours of nap time or four hours of childcare, it does really focus you. Um, And then when you're off, you have to be off. Uh, But at the same time, you know, writing Northern Spy and paying someone to watch my um, son, there's this awful thing of writing where you think, okay, was that worth $20 an hour of childcare? You know, those like four sentences that I wrote. Um, So it does add a certain amount of pressure, I think. So Flynn, do you consider yourself a uh, a pantser or a plotter? Uh, which which of those camps do you fall into? I am very much a pantser, but I am jealous of plotters because the way I write feels so inefficient. Because I'll I'll write a very very long first draft and then often decide that it's completely wrong and sort of start over, um, <laughs> and end up with these just like stacks of drafted pages and. You know, I've heard of writers who just sit down and they start with the first sentence of chapter one and they end at the ending. And that seems so civilized. Uh, but I think for me, figuring out the story as I go and kind of learning it alongside the characters means that I'm surprised by what happens next. And hopefully then the reader will be surprised as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Northern Spy is your your third third book um, that uh, that is published and, and out now. Did, was this the um, have there only been three books or are there you know desk drawer novels uh, other ones out there? Yeah, there there's a desk drawer novel that I wrote before Under the Harrow when I was in I started it when I was in college and then worked on it in graduate school. Uh, and that will never, ever see the light of day. But I think it was the, one of the best parts about going to graduate school for me and having all these visiting writers come through was learning that people's first novel is very rarely their actual first novel. And that's right. totally normal to have your sort of like abandoned effort where you were figuring out what, what you needed to do. Um, I really, I found that kind of freeing that just because you've written something doesn't mean you have to sort of stay with it. And that's okay to let things go. Do you find that um, that little pieces of that first novel have a way of working their way into, um, you know, current works and, and process, or is 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 that just an entity of in and of itself, and and you know, it it doesn't bleed out into anything else? Mm, I think it does bleed out a little bit, be, uh, also because I lived with it for so long, so I worked on it right. on and off for I don't know six years or something, um, and. I I think it's usually just maybe snippets like uh, a description of snow or a landscape. And I'll think, oh, that's, you know, an echo of, of what I was working on with that. But that book actually, it had a male narrator. And I think my writing 
became a lot better and stronger when I started writing from a woman's point of view. And I, I don't know if this is the case, but I think I suspect that my first book was trying to write something serious or something that would be taken seriously or that I thought was, you know, literary fiction. And that then when I started writing what became Under the Harrow and then Double Life and Northern Spy, it, it felt like um, actually writing what I, what I cared about and that was more intimate um, for me. And I think that was a better choice. All three of your novels have been set uh, in, in the British Isles. Um, what is your fascination with, with British culture and British life? Yeah, and so I, I've had that for a while. And then just, I think, a year ago, my brother actually did 23andMe and found that most of the people who share our DNA live in Dublin. And I thought, aha, that's that's where it came <laughs> from. It felt like this really nice sort of like justification of of my fascination because I've always just been so drawn to Ireland and to Britain. Um, I think it's probably because the books I love the most when I was little are set in England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales. And so it feels like almost a fictional landscape come to life whenever I visit there. It feels like I'm I'm walking through one of the books I've loved. Um, and then it's also, I think, just the language I find really appealing, uh, especially writing this book and, and using Belfast slang and Belfast dialogue. Uh, it just felt really fun to play with. So you don't live uh, in, in Ireland or, or Britain, do you? I don't. I've, I've spent time there for research trips. Um, and I have this kind of like constant question about if I would like to relocate there. But I think I just my family's here. And my friends yeah. are here. I think it's it's um, just not really going to be in the cards yet. But I I just really love contemporary writing that's coming out of Ireland in particular, um, and still feel this really strong connection to it. Like it's in my blood somehow. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. So when you, when you take a, uh, a research trip, um, are you... Are you visiting to uh, to pick up landmarks and uh, you know pieces of setting that will make the the story more believable for the reader? Are you are you there to to pick up uh, sort of the the vibe of the language and, and the feeling of things? What, what are what are things that you look for that you take back home with you? Mm, yeah, I think it's all of that, and I end up feeling just you know full research notebooks with with observations or bits of overheard dialogue and um, landmarks 
but then it's, I think it's just getting what you can't find online. So like you can do a pretty huge amount of location research with just, you know, Google street view and seeing what a street actually looks like. But then in the book, Tessa works at the BBC broadcasting house in Belfast. And I got to shadow a producer in the building. And at one point I was in the staff kitchen and I was making a cup of tea where Tessa would make a cup of tea on her breaks. And I was looking at the, you know, like the cartoons that were taped to the fridge or the signs about, you know, not eating someone else's food that's in the fridge. And I feel like those details you just can't get unless you're actually there. And it felt like getting a really necessary level of kind of texture for the book. So you're absolutely right that um, Google Street View is amazing, and you can pick up little details that that uh, just are, you know make the story immersive. But what you can't get from that are the sounds of the street or the mm-hmm. smells of the street, and, and sometimes those little nuggets can really uh, immerse someone in the story. Are are there certain um, characteristics of places? that you look for or listen for or, or smell for in a place that, that just really, um, you know, sucks you into the story. Yeah. I think it's all that. Um, I, I feel very curious about weather. I think I really want to get the weather right. Um, I really love descriptions of the ocean and swimming. And when I was there, I was really trying to get those, those down. Right. Um, and then I, I think, Like you said, it's like getting that whole panorama. So one thing that you might not be able to tell from a street view is that Belfast is on a harbor and then there are mountains all around it. So there's this one in particular called Cave Hill that has this really dramatic profile, this kind of like moody green cliff above the city. Um, And that seems it's it's that kind of detail, I think, that kind of scope where you can you can see what the actual atmosphere is like and um i remember at one point watching someone like unloading crates of beer into a bar um and just i don't think that actually ever made it into the book but just those little sort of surrounding scenes seem really important so Flynn, I'm I'm fascinated by where a story begins. Um, one moment, uh, Northern Spy does not exist it, it, in any form or fashion, um, and then either a character walks into the stage of your mind, or you're you're reading something, or see a news uh, a story, or, or read an article, and and the what if game starts playing in your mind, and then all of a sudden. Uh, you know, this tapestry unfolds and people inhabit it and and Northern Spy exists in some form in your mind. And then, you know, you go through the work of discovering the story and getting it on the page and editing and all of that stuff. Um, but do you remember what the first thing about this book was that came to you? Um, uh, you know, was it Tessa? What Was it someone else? Was it something else that you had been reading or or, or watching? Mm, Yeah, there have been a few sort of sparks. One of the sparks was I saw an archival photograph from the Troubles of two young women with long hair in miniskirts and berets standing in a field and their their backs are turned to the camera and they're holding uh, automatic rifles. And they were members of the IRA. And I was just thinking, what is going on in those in those girls' heads and how did they get to this point and who are they? And I, I had been really curious about that photograph for years. And then the other sort of spark was when I became pregnant, the character of Tessa kind of appeared first as a woman who was I was I was sort of thinking about I think you already feel so vulnerable when you're pregnant. Um, and I was wondering what it would be like to feel that way and then also be in a society that has this really high threat level at the moment in Belfast. Um, so she started off actually pregnant and then in later versions was edited. So now she has a, a six month old baby at the start of the book. Um, but yeah, I, I find that so interesting, too. And I'm always curious about it because it does seem kind of extraordinary that some ideas stick and some don't. And I don't really know why 
that's the case, like why some will catch fire and others just don't seem to go anywhere. When, uh, when I realized that this book was, um, uh, you know, about the conflict in, in Northern Ireland and, and based around there, I got to remembering, um, uh, you know, just, you know, things we'd see on the news and, uh, and things like that. This is not a conflict that is very old at all. And, um, something that sitting in America, it, it's almost, it, it's just bizarre to think that, that these are our, our neighbors, um, that, and, and, and that life could be this way. Um, what did you, what sort of research did you do for, to get the feeling of living in a conflict like this? Mm. Yeah, I did a lot of reading and I watched a lot of documentaries and listened to political radio shows and tried to just sort of absorb as much as I possibly could. And then I also talked to um, a few women who became hugely sort of influential in writing the book because they had grown up as children during the Troubles. And I was really fascinated by their memories of what was in some ways like a pretty ordinary childhood or adolescence. And in other ways, a completely extreme uh, situation of living in a war zone where there would be soldiers sometimes in their front gardens or um, bomb scares. And that kind of living alongside fear felt also in a way not that foreign. I think we've had so many kind of like shocking and horrible uh, acts of violence in our own country that in a way we've been exposed to the kind of um, heightened threat levels that, that were in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. The, the, the book, um, deals with a, a, a family in crisis, a, a family mystery while also immersed in all of this, uh, this political intrigue that's going on. Um, how did you decide to, um, you know, to bring the story, you know, kind of down close to, to a family story in the midst of this, this greater, um, you know, drama that's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it it felt like that sort of happened naturally because I think even even in the worst of the troubles, people's primary thoughts were probably still about their children or their husbands or wives or their job. Um, you know, like, even if you're living in this really extreme scenario, you still have all of these other considerations. And one thing I was curious about was that Tessa doesn't get any sort of like dispensation um the fact that she's living in basically a war zone doesn't mean that it'll be any easier to do her job or raise a child on her own um, and people just have to figure out how to get by and that seemed to be something that i heard quite a lot when i was interviewing different people and then also i think the characters just sort of develop and my my goal is to feel like i'm writing someone else's diary and that i'm sitting down and i'm writing with that sort of level of intimacy with them and so her relationship with her mother just kind of grew from from that, from picturing, OK, you have these two women in a room. What will they actually say to each other? And what's the sort of background of, um, you know, love and resentment and arguments that, that exist in the family? And then uh, Tessa's sister, um, Marion, uh, you know, Tessa thinks that she knows everything about this person and um, something happens. I'll, I'll let you tell the listeners what you want to about it. Um, something happens and and Tessa is uh, forced to, you know, um, weigh what she thinks she knows about family with um, what the realities are. And it really sets up um a great tension there for for Tessa. Um, how, how did you decide to, you know, the, the sister drama? Mm, yeah, I, I wanted to have two women with different kind of roles in the conflict. And at first I didn't know that they would be sisters. And it it's like, I feel like you sort of forget what happens in earlier drafts because the real one seems to be whatever right. it becomes. Um, but then with the sisters, I found it really interesting to think about what, would make someone from the same family take such a different route 
in life, which uh, felt sort of right for fiction. And at the start of the novel, Tessa, she's at work at the BBC. She's recently returned from maternity leave and she sees surveillance footage uh, from a security camera that shows an IRA robbery at a gas station. And she sees her sister pulling a black ski mask over her face. And the police think that Marion is part of the IRA. And Tessa thinks that she has been sort of coerced into participating or doesn't really know what has happened. And so then the book is both Tessa's investigation and the police investigation from that point on. Um, and I, I liked having that kind of mystery at the start of the book. What's what's fascinating to me is that, um, you know, not living in Ireland, um, everything that I know about the conflicts um, really – uh, you know, or, or more academic than than anything. Um, but then when you start seeing a family that's on either side uh, of this and, and start seeing how, you know, it affects interpersonal relationships, not just the politics of the day, that's where it really gets powerful, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and that's the sort of interesting, one of the interesting things about The Troubles is that it was fought on the home front. You know, there there wasn't, a sort of like theater of war that people went to and then they returned home. There was, it was just alongside daily life and it was woven through daily life and it was in families. And, you know, that, that felt really um, sort of just, just hugely dramatic that you don't have a kind of break from what's happening. And even places like, um, the farms around the town where Tessa lives. Uh, she lives in a town called Gray Abbey in the book. And there have been farms where uh, there have been underground sort of bunkers that are full of weapons of guns and bombs in Northern Ireland or underground shooting ranges under farms. Um, and it's, it's so strange to think that this really green, gorgeous landscape has uh, this kind of, thread of violence running through it you you mentioned earlier flynn that um you know you forget what the earlier story was that because the the final story kind of in in your mind at least becomes the real story and 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 you forget all the changes that the characters and the story went through um it, when you when you finish a draft and then you, you're going to start you know editing and working on a second draft or a third draft um do you begin again at the beginning and and work through the manuscript all the way through or are you looking for certain elements that that need to be edited like how do you uh, when you finish it how do you approach it again with fresh eyes to to then see where the story might go mm, yeah so i i had one professor in my graduate program who gave really good advice which was when you finish a draft to print it out and then sit down and read it all the way through without a pen in your hand. So don't let yourself make any edits. Don't let yourself even think about what could be edited and just sit down and read it through and then let it sort of rest in your mind for a bit and then go back and start making the edits. So to sort of try to see it as a reader would and from the outside um, before you then dive in. And so I, I did that with this book. Um, and then I, I, I can't really remember what the drafts also sort of start to blur together. Um, but with this one, I, I had written a full longhand draft and typed it up and read it through and then decided that actually the kind of plot was going in the wrong direction and then started over from the beginning, writing it again. Um, so there's a lot of work that I guess my hope is that it's sort of like an iceberg principle where all of the work that goes on is under the surface and that even if um, it's not actually on the page that somehow it will like lend authenticity or, or meaning to the story. How painful is that to, to print off the draft and read it without a pen in your hand? Do you find yourself going, Oh man, I would love to move this sentence around or to change the way I said that. And, and, and know that, no, I, j I just have to read it. Yeah, it's really funny to try to turn off the editor part of your brain <laughs> for the duration of reading it because you do think, oh, okay, I have to remember that, you know, this character should say this differently or, or you know, you have a great idea for what a character should do and you have to sort of hope that you won't forget it. Um, but I think that it's that goal of just trying to read it as though you're not 
the writer and seeing what's actually coming across and where the most kind of energy is or where the most heat is in the book and then and then going back to those parts and sort of working from there so flynn now that northern spy is out everywhere and and we're going to put links in the show notes where you can grab it in kindle edition or hardcover or audiobook um what do you find yourself working on these days so i've just sort of settled into working on something new um and it's it's set in New England, and it's also a sort of psychological suspense book. Um, but I'm superstitious at this stage, so I'm, I'm not talking about too much. But New England, as in America. America, yes, that's right. That's that's going to be interesting. I, I can't wait to see what you do there. Um, so Flynn, if if people are are just discovering you, want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, um, where can they find you online? So I'm on Twitter at Flynnberry underscore, and I'm on Instagram at Flynnberry Author. Great. We'll put links to those in the show notes as well. Northern Spy available everywhere now. Go grab it today. Um, there are links to it in the show notes. Flynn, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is a delight. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started. Are you looking for software that helps you bring your novel to life? Novelize is a web-based writing app which allows you to access your work on any device with a browser and an internet connection right from your desktop, laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Just get the novel written. Say goodbye to sticky notes. With our notebook on the side, you can keep track of all the important information you need to write your novel. We keep distractions to a minimum, help you track your progress, and encourage you to write more novels. You can even use the same notebook for your novels in a series. Outline, write, or organize your novel by switching between modes. You can write your outline notes while you're writing, and you can move scenes and chapters around anytime in the organized mode. Choose between the dark and light theme to help prevent eye strain so that you can stay immersed in your book. Novelize, the app for writers by writers. 